So this is a photograph of Al Purdy taken in 1970, a photo taken by Sheldon Grimson uh, uh, for an anthology of Canadian poetry called 15 Canadian Poets uh, that was published that year. A few years after this photograph was taken, Purdy wrote a letter to a, a Montreal poet who had written to him asking for advice about his poems. He was about to prepare this Montreal poet, a guy by the name of Brian McCarthy, and he was about to prepare a selected edition of his poems, and he'd sent them to Purdy to ask him, you know, which ones should be in and which ones should go. In his reply, Purdy says that your poems are too often complaints about the world. They're, they're, they're angry poems, like those that uh, Milton Acorn and Irving Layton had made into something like a standard for Canadian poetry at the time, especially poetry by men. This is a part of what Purdy says in his letter to Brian McCarthy, 1973. Your ranting is much the same as Acorn's ranting. What about that slight smile or even that wholehearted grin you bestowed grudgingly on some large or small gal? Isn't that worth a poem too? There are no poems in the world of blackness and condemnation which do not also include an urgent feeling of tenderness and pity. That sympathy is part of the reason why Purdy became something that only pops up once every couple of generations. And that is a genuinely popular poet. He grew up at a time when serious literature, serious art, was generally pretty tough-minded. Uh, when he was eight years old, Ernest Hemingway published his novel, The Sun Also Rises. The Sun Also Rises, with its famous ending in which Brett tells her would-be lover Jake that they might have had a good life together. And Jake responds, yes, isn't it pretty to think so? Not the happy ending of Victorian fiction or of commercial fiction before, then, or after, or of any time. Those kind of endings might be pretty, but they're not true. They're not authentic, not, not for the generation between the wars. Instead of making readers happy by affirming what they believed or wanted to be true, serious literature, the time that Purdy became a writer, generally aimed at challenging those beliefs, at unsettling those beliefs instead of reaffirming them. Not all of it, but enough of it that the highbrow literature of Purdy's formative years is pretty serious stuff. It is often pretty angry stuff. It is art that is generally not interested in laughter unless it's ironic. And especially, it is art that hates sentimentality unless it's ironic. Isn't it pretty to think so? That is the kind of literature that Irving Layton and Milton Acorn mostly wrote. Uh, seriously angry poems by seriously angry poets. It's not the kind of poems that Purdy wrote. His poems are much more openly and sincerely sentimental than most of his contemporaries in Canada or elsewhere. There are, of course, exception, exceptions to that in his work, but his poems like to laugh. There's a poem in his uh, first real book that has the best title I know of, for a Canadian poem or a poem anywhere. It's called For Norma in Lieu of an Orgasm. <laughs> there's a poem he wrote called Dark Landscape in which he says, there's them that die of living and there's them that joy in dying. But all I have is wine and laughter. There's a, a relatively little known by Purdy from the 60s that I think could stand as his Ars Poetica, his, his poem ab about his art. It's called The Sculptors, and it's spoken by a man, pretty clearly Purdy himself, who is looking at wooden crates full of Inuit carvings that are en route to Toronto, but have been declared substandard by the Hudson's Bay buyer to which they're going, they're broken or defective in some way. These are the ones the store doesn't want to buy. And Purdy wants to buy every single one of them himself. The crippled polar bear, 
the amputee seal, the walrus with one tusk, the dog that has to be labeled dog. <laughs> and that's purdy, I think. Laughter, uh, sympathy, pity for the underdog, even a, even a dog that has to be labeled dog. He is, of course, uh, best known not really for that, um, but for writing poems about places in Canada, poems that helped write Canada into existence. Uh, his contemporary, the, his fellow poet Doug Jones, said that in a purdy poem, you can generally find a purdy poem on a map. That is, when you read them, you know exactly where they take place because they say so somewhere in the poem. You can find most of them and all of the best remembered of them on a map of Canada. Poems set in and about cities, small towns, and rural regions across this country, from Newfoundland to Vancouver Island and up to Baffin Island. He loved poems about real people in real places. His poems are all music on a tombstone, which is the title of one of them. They want to say the names, the title of another to record the names of Canadian people and Canadian places, like the, the roll call of Ontario townships in his best known poem, The Country North of Belleville. When he died, the British Columbia poet Patrick Lane said in the Globe and Mail that Purdy named us and he turned our people and our land into poetry. He is often thought of as both a national and a nationalist poet, as the Canadian poet. Sam Selecki has a, a book about Purdy called The Last Canadian Poet. That sentimental streak of Purdy's, rather than any coherent set of political convictions, is what made him a nationalist. His affection for Canada and for Canadian places and Canadian stories and Canadian people comes from the same place as his affection for those defective Inuit carvings. That is sympathy for the underdog. He wrote in one of his poems that uh, all of us need something to lift us from ourselves. A thing we touch that touches a future we don't know. We need something to lift us from ourselves. He actually said that about Cubans in a poem called Fidel Castro in Revolutionary Square. But he learned it in Canada, and he meant it about Canada and about Canadians. Part of the reason that Purdy wrote about so many places in Canada is that he moved around a great deal. He grew up in small town Ontario. He became a poet in Vancouver and in Montreal and he traveled across this country uh, multiple times. On the last page of his autobiography, he says, my hometown is Canada. His actual hometown was the small town of Trenton in Ontario, uh, now best known as the home of a large Canadian forces base. He was born on a farm about 10 miles outside of town. His father was 58 years old when Purdy was born and his father died just two years later when Purdy was two in 1920. Purdy and his mother moved to Trenton into a red brick house on Front Street next door to Campbell's Tombstone Works. His boyhood home is now uh, an empty lot beside a liquor store, which is surely a metaphor for something. <laughs> he was an only child and he says that his mother pampered him. Um, among other things, she paid him five cents a book to read Dickens novels. <laughs> Which doesn't actually sound like pampering to me, but there you go. Um, he preferred pulp magazines, things like uh, Black Mask and Doc Savage, popular books by people like Tom Swift, Horatio Alger, Zane Grey, Saturday afternoon serials at Weller's Theatre. He began writing poems at the age of 13 for the usual reason, because he discovered that it impressed girls. He published a few poems in the school newspaper, including one prophetically called Canada, 
But other than that, and playing football, he did poorly in school, and he ended his formal education by failing grade nine. In 1936, he decided to go west, not to find work, as many others were doing during what is now the Depression, but just because he was 17 and bored and looking for something to do. That's pretty at about this time, though he's got the year wrong. This is from his autobiography, and he didn't have access to his papers at that time, so there's some mistakes of dates, but this is pretty the year he left on this trip. He hitchhiked to north of Sault Ste. Marie, which at that time was as far as you could get by hitchhiking, because the highway ran out at Sault Ste. Marie then. And uh, he hopped a freight train there and rode the rails through the prairies uh, to the mountains and the sea. In Vancouver, he saw a Dorothy L'Amour movie, visited Stanley Park, and that same day jumped on a train headed back east. <laughs> uh, he did it again and again. Uh, he'd work in the winters, and then he would ride the rails. Uh, he did this in the summers and the winters of 1937 and 38. In 1939, uh, Hitler gave him something else to do. He enlisted in the Royal Canadian Air Force. He spent the war at Air Force bases in Ontario and in British Columbia, uh, mostly on guard duty uh, because his blood pressure kept him out of the sky as an active pilot. He was promoted briefly to corporal, uh, but demoted soon and often for insubordination and various derelictions of duty. He says in one of his poems that he was demoted so many times that he ended up saluting civilians. <laughs> in 1941, he married one of those derelictions of duty, Eurith Parkhurst, a farmer's daughter from the country north of Belleville. Their only son, Jimmy, was born two weeks before the bombs fell on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Al and Urith uh, quarreled a great deal, um, but they loved each other. I don't think he was ever close with his son. I don't, I don't know why. Um, the definitive biography of Purdy remains to be written. During the war, he began publishing poems in service magazines, uh, magazines uh, as well like the Canadian Forum and especially in the Vancouver Sun, the newspaper. By 1944, he had enough poems to make a small book. So he went to a company in Vancouver, a printing company. He paid them $200 to print 500 copies for him. It's called The Enchanted Echo. If you can find a copy today, uh, one copy will cost you far more than what Purdy paid to get all of them printed back in 1944. Partly because he didn't pay the printer's bill, so the printer ended up destroying most of the copies <laughs> by way of revenge. So. It's a very rare book. After the war, uh, Purdy ran a taxi slash bootlegging business with his father-in-law in Belleville that managed to escape the police, but not eventually the bank. He and his family moved to Vancouver, <coughs> excuse me, in 1950. <coughs> excuse me. Ureth found work at a hospital, secretarial work, and Al at a mattress factory. They lived in a small house in the East End beside the tram tracks. Al learned to make homemade beer. He became good friends with a bookseller by the name of Stephen McIntyre, who introduced him to books by writers that were better than those he was used to reading. People like T.S. Eliot, Virginia Woolf, Thomas Mann, and William Butler Yeats. At this time, Purdy also became a, a drinking friend of a guy by the name of Kurt Lang who is today almost forgotten. Um, but in the early 60s, Kurt Lang was one of the most notorious figures on the beat poetry scene in Vancouver. He was a kind of Vancouver Neil Cassidy. This is Purdy in the middle here, and Kurt Lang is the very young boy on his right with no shirt on. Um, Doug Kay is the guy on the left. He and his wife, Hannah Kay, ran a bookstore across from Robson Street, on Robson Street, across from the library in Vancouver, Doug and Hannah Kay's bookstore. That's the first place that George Bowering ever tasted Al Purdy's homemade wine, which he said tasted like the tar you pull up from the road. <laughs> um, Eureth is not in the picture because she took the picture. 
I think the woman is Doug Kay's sister. I'm not sure. That's on Kitsilano Beach. In 1955, Purdy went to Europe with Kurt Lang and another friend by the name of Jim Polson. Uh, they sailed from Montreal and they visited Paris, London, and New York. In Montreal, he stayed with Irving Layton. Uh, this is their first meeting. Purdy had written to Layton, he had seen some of his poems, and he had written to him from Vancouver to say he admired them. Layton wrote him back and said, good, here's a bunch of my books for you to go sell at Vancouver bookstores. <laughs> he met other Montreal poets on this trip. He had a beer with Frank Scott uh, at the Ritz-Carlton pub, coffee with Louis Dudek at Murray's restaurant. When he got back to Vancouver, um, he decided that he could make beer just as easily in Montreal as in Vancouver, and that there were more poets per square mile there to help him drink it. So he and Yurith left Vancouver in the summer of 1956, and they rented an apartment in Cote de Neige. It was an intoxicating and euphoric period to be a writer in Montreal, he later wrote. We were all great writers, or would be soon. They drank with the Leightons, the Scots, <coughs> occasionally Louis Dudek, and Hugh McLennan, and a, a, a very young, recent graduate from McGill University, Leonard Cohen. He became especially po close with a poet from Prince Edward Island, Milton Acorn from Charlottetown, um, who was a war veteran with a metal plate in his head and claimed to be descended from Bavarian devil worshippers. <laughs> Al published uh, poems in a magazine edited by Louis Dudek called Delta, and a magazine edited by Ray Souster called Combustion and he sold a number of plays to CBC Radio, verse plays to CBC Radio. Eurith worked as a secretary for CP Rail. In the spring of 1957, the Purdy's left Montreal. Uh, Al's mother was getting old in Trenton, and they went back to Trenton to stay with her and live in Al's boyhood home and look after her. With money that he had earned from the CBC Radio, they put $300 down on an $800 lot a half hour away on the shore of a small lake across from the village of Ameliasburg. Eurith found a plan for an A-frame cottage in a magazine called House Beautiful. Her father provided advice and a truck and Al bought a load of used lumber and other building supplies from a building that was being demolished in Belleville. Milton Acorn came out and helped him build it. Milton had been a carpenter, or said he had. Al didn't think he had. <laughs> they had no electricity, uh, no plumbing, and very little money. They got some food from a neighbor's garden, some from the lake, some from the road, uh, some from the AMP supermarket dumpster, which is one of Al's favorite raiding places. Al made wine from wild grapes, oranges, dandelions, rhubarb, pineapples, whatever he could find in the garbage or growing. They were poor and hungry, and when winter came, cold. They fought a lot. They went back to Montreal for the winter of 1959 to find enough work to let them keep eating and to finish the house. Eurith found secretarial work again. Al worked in a mattress factory again in the East End. He started a literary magazine himself with Milton Acorn, a magazine called Moment. The first issues of this were produced with a, a mimeograph machine that Milton Acorn stole from the uh, Canadian Communist Party. <laughs> that fall, he published a, another small chapbook of poems, um, his fourth, with uh, Ryerson Press. It's called The Craft So Long to Learn and he dedicated it to Leighton and to Acorn. There are poems in it about drinking with Malcolm Lowry in Vancouver, prostitutes in a Toronto hotel, the rain, birds, Roblin Lake. They're still at this point, at least in my opinion, self-consciously poems with a capital P, not, not yet poetry. Um, he tells himself in the second poem to embrace my verse the language of the age. But as you can hear from that line, he hadn't quite done it yet. 
In the spring of 1961, he won his first Canada Council grant, $1,000. He used the money to revisit a place in northern British Columbia that he had been stationed during the war, near Hazleton on the Skeena River, home of the Gitsan First Nation. That trip gave him some of the poems that ended up in his first real book, but that is not a chapbook, but a real book, Poems for All the Annettes, published in 1962. This was published by a, a small press called Contact Press that had been established 10 years before, in 1952, by Louis Dudek, Irving Layton, and the Toronto poet Raymond Souster. Contact Press was initially a, a vanity press, or what Dudek preferred to call a private press. And by that he meant a press in which most of the books the press published are by the editors themselves, and they pay for the publication themselves. In 1959, a, a Toronto banker by the name of Peter Miller replaced Irving Layton on the board of Contact Press, and he began paying for many of the books himself. And he shifted the center of the press from Montreal to Toronto. And he changed it into what became English Canada's first modern small press. The publisher of uh, first books of poetry by Alden Nolan, Milton Acorn, Gwen McEwen, George Bowring, John Newlove, Margaret Atwood, and Al Purdy. From the mid-50s to the mid-60s, Contact Press was where the cool kids wanted to be. This was the press. Purdy liked to say that his only rule for writing poetry was that there are no rules. And this is the book that kind of declared that for him, that announced it. Uh, he called it a watershed in my own development. When you go back and read Margaret Atwood's early books of poems, they're consistent, remarkably consistent, tonally consistent, stylistically consistent, the same voice in the same world. Purdy's poems are all over the place. And I think that's partly because that's the way his mind worked and where his interests went. He, he was a magpie happy to write about whatever caught his attention in whatever style or voice seemed to him to work for that particular subject. There are nature poems in this book and city poems. There are poems for women and poems for poets. There are poems that like lots of big words and poems that don't use any big words and instead swear a lot. There are poems that use the play with the space on the page, the way the cool kids on the West Coast were starting to do it, and there are poems that line up politely on the left. This is the book in which Purdy finally figured out what kind of poet he was not, not quite yet the poet that he was. It did well. It sold out its first print run, probably 200 copies, and it won attention from other poets. The British Columbia poet George Bowring who would become one of Purdy's closest friends, said in his review that it announced Purdy as the leading poet of his generation in Canada, as Irving Layton was of his, which can't have made Irving Layton terribly happy. <laughs> it also gave him, Purdy, the confidence to submit the manuscript for his next book to a commercial publisher, a trade house, McClellan and Stewart in Toronto. They bought it for $100 and 10% royalties. The first of Al Purdy's many books for McClellan and Stewart was published in April of 1965. It's called The Caribou Horses. Uh, this is the book that, that established Purdy's tone, his, his conversational tone. They're mostly poems about himself, confessional poems about people and places in his life. There are some poems in it that are set outside Canada, like Cuba. Uh, Purdy had visited Cuba the year before the book came out as a guest of the Cuban government. He met uh, Fidel Castro on that trip and Che Guevara. Um, one of the other Canadian guests of the Cuban government at that time in Havana was a, 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 a law professor from the University of Montreal, a guy by the name of Pierre Elliott Trudeau. <laughs> and him and Purdy ducked out of a ballet one night and made a midnight walk across Havana together. It's a very Canadian book, an unapologetically Canadian book by the standards of the time. Canadian subjects, Canadian places, poems about winter, poems about hockey, poems about beer, uh, 
There's even a, a poem about the LCBO. It's, it's called Complaint Lodged with the LCBO. Uh, this poem set in Roblin Lake, Medicine Hat, Stanley Park in Vancouver, and of course most famously a poem set in Southern Ontario that had already by this point won the President's Medal of the University of Western Ontario when it was first published in a magazine called the Tamarack Review. It's a poem called The Country North of Belleville. It's a bit strange that a poem called The Country North of Belleville should become Purdy's signature poem because he actually admits in his autobiography that he never could tell north from south. <laughs> so it's entirely possible that the country north of Belleville is actually south of Belleville. Um, he says in his autobiography, I can get lost in a telephone booth. <laughs> Maybe that's why I needed poems. The Caribou Horses won the Governor General's Award for Poetry. Uh, Purdy had to borrow a suit from his brother-in-law to attend the ceremony in Ottawa. After that, things got a little bit easier for the Purdy's financially. Uh, they are still poor, especially by today's standards, but they're not worried about starving anymore. He won his second Canada Council grant that same year, uh, $4,000, and he used the money to fly to Baffin Island and look for some more poems. I found the first poem while he was still on the air, a, a stewardess called Suzanne. He stayed at a, a, an Inuit kids hostel in Pangnertung Island for the first few weeks. And then he accompanied uh, an Inuit family to their Ireland, island camp, their hunting camp in Cumberland Sound for two weeks. When he got back, he spent um, three weeks at a poetry conference in Cardiff, Wales, and then the winter in Toronto, where Urith went to teacher's college. The following summer, he and Urith visited Newfoundland after picking up his Governor General Award Medal in Ottawa. He wrote to a friend from Newfoundland, rain, rain, rain here. I'm so sick of scenery, I'll never say a word about nature again. <laughs> On the way back, they stopped in St. John, New Brunswick to meet the poet, Alden Nolan. Um, Nolan's from a small town in Nova Scotia, but he, uh, at a very young age, he went to New Brunswick to become a journalist, and at this point he was working for the St. John Telegraph Journal. Nolan won his own Governor General's Award the year after this for a book called Bread, Wine, and Salt. Uh, wonderful poet. Uh, it was an awkward visit. Uh, Nolan could be painfully shy, uh, at least sober, and I guess the, the visit didn't go terribly well. In September of 1967, so Canada's centennial year, Purdy published the book that came out of his trip to Baffin Island. It's called North of Summer. Uh, the cover and eight color plates inside of it are by the Group of Seven painter A.Y. Jackson, provided uh, to McClellan Stewart by the Hudson's Bay Company. Purdy hated them. Uh, he wrote to Margaret Lawrence that they look like geriatric vomit done from habit. <laughs> what he wanted to illustrate the book, he had met an old Anouk in Pangnertung and he got him to do some drawings for him, and that's what he wanted to illustrate the book. But Jack said no, and went with the Jackson paintings instead. As I said, the book opens with a poem about the French-Canadian stewardess that he met on the plane. After that, they're all set on Baffin Island. There's poems about hunting with the Inuit, uh, lying in a tent with a fever, the difficulties of taking a crap outside when you're surrounded by huskies with a ravenous taste for human excrement. Uh, I can only imagine, uh, literally. Uh, there's a poem about singing You Are My Sunshine with a group of Inuit women. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of poems about the weather. Baby, it's cold outside, he says. He says in a postscript, that the poems seem to him like a set of binoculars through which you can view the Arctic from several thousand miles away. They read to me more like letters, or something like letters. They're like fact-filled postcards in verse. Uh, from a stranger in a strange land. He calls himself a kind of witness, Kabluna, the white man, memorizing details. <laughs> 
they seem to me now, I'm not necessarily the best judge of these things, but they seem to me now to be empathetic in the right kind of way. That is, he doesn't try to lock the Inuit in the past, uh, the way that the Inuit carving craze of the time, for example, did, that said that all the Inuit knew and could represent was traditional means of hunting. He sees and records their Coleman stoves, their Evinrude motors, their Remington rifles, their affection for American popular music and American movies. It's a, a thoughtful and entertaining book, a, a close look at a, a remarkable place. My favorite, I think, of his books, other than the selected ones. I'll read you one, short one. Sorry. This is called At the Movies. The setting is really unreal. About 150 Eskimos and Whites jammed into a Nissan hut to watch Gary Cooper and Burt Lancaster in a Technicolor Western shoot-me-up. Eskimos don't understand the dialogue at all, but they like the action. And when noble Gary is in danger or sinister Lancaster acts menacing, a tide of emotion sweeps the hot little hut and kids crawling on the floor are quiet, sensing what their parents feel, that something tremendously important is happening. When the Anglican minister changes reels, his blonde head glinting as he administers spiritual unction to his flock, cigarettes are lit and everyone talks and a kid crawls under my legs grinning bashfully. Jim Calabuck says something I can't quite hear. A baby cries in the pouch on his mother's back and is joggled gently. It's hot and stuffy as hell in the theater. Doors have to be opened. The odor of white and Eskimo making a point for air conditioning. Lights go out and Gary Cooper rides again. The forces of evil are finally defeated. Only the virtuous bullet kills. Violence neutralizes violence like a mustard plaster. Though I kind of like the bad guy. The way it always does in American movies with an obvious moral, a clear-cut denouement. Outside, the fjord looks like poured blue milk. Mountains like bookmarks under a cold sky. Islands are moonscapes. Where this story happens, it's 11 p.m. Some of the hunters visit their boats where dead caribou drain into bilge water. And the rest of the moviegoers go home to tents on the beach or prefab houses and dogs howl to make everything regional. But the point I'd hope to separate from all these factual things stubbornly resist me. And I walk home slowly, feeling stupid, rejecting the obvious, threading my way between stones and the mud with the beginnings of a headache. It did very well for him, that book. Uh, got great reviews. Uh, that fall, he and Leighton gave a reading from, uh, he was reading from this book at Queen's University, which 500 people showed up for the reading. Uh, they had to sit in the aisles for a poetry reading. CBC Radio aired a documentary about him called No Other Country, The Rural Poems of Alfred Purdy. Purdy went through a, a long period in which he never quite sorted out which first name he wanted to be known by. So sometimes it's W.A. Purdy, sometimes it's W. Alfred Poet Purdy, then it's Alfred Purdy, but you know, now Al Purdy. The CBC documentary Purdy wrote and narrated the script himself uh, about life in Roblin Lake, and the actors read his poems. In 1968, the House of Anansi published an updated version of Poems for All the Annettes. Um, by this time, McClellan Stewart had become his new publisher. He was under contract to McClellan Stewart. There are new poems in this book that legally belong to McClellan Stewart because they had been written at before, after McClellan Stewart acquired him as an author. Uh, 
So what he did, him and Nancy, well, I don't, I shouldn't say, I don't know how much Nancy was actually involved in this, but somebody did. Then he just backdated the new poems. So and when they appear in the book, they've got dates on them like 1963, 1964, but they were actually written in 1968. And he did that to hide them from his new publisher. Uh, one of his best known poems, that's true of, at the Quinty Hotel, which is dated 1964 in the book, but was actually written in 1968. A few months later in September, McClellan Stewart published their new Purdy book, the one that should have had these poems in it, um, Wild Grape Wine. Um, and that same month, September of 1968, an Edmonton publisher, the bookseller Mel Hertig, published Al Purdy's best-selling book ever. It's not poetry. It's a collection of 50 opinions on America by Canadian writers in fiction, poetry, essays, parables, and open letters. Uh, Purdy selected and introduced them. It's called The New Romans, Candid Canadian Opinions of the United States. <coughs> Excuse me. Hertig published it because Jack McClellan wasn't interested. One of his very few mistakes as a publisher. The book sold around 30,000 copies, which is easily 30 times what any of Purdy's books of poems sold. It is a book that is exceedingly angry at America, with Vietnam heading the list of reasons why. Ray Souster has a poem in it called Death Chant for Mr. Johnson's America. The Cape Breton writer Ray Smith has a short story in it that recommends sending a centennial gift to the president, um, an American tourist's ear in a matchbox. The Quebecois poet André Major says, the best I can hope for is that Americans will die of remorse before the hatred of the world is unleashed against them. Margaret Lawrence provides an open letter to the mother of a 12-year-old black boy shot by police in Detroit, a boy by the name of Joe Bass, that ends, I am afraid for all of our children. So it was an, an angry time. Um, and there were a lot of people, some of you in this room will know this better than I do, that were very upset with America at uh, this time. Um, deja vu. Um, there are some contributors in it, uh, notably and best, I think, Robert Fulford, uh, who makes um, some version of the love America, hate the current administration argument. Um, but there are only two out of 50 in the entire book who defend America without qualification. And that's uh, Hugh Garner and Irving Layton. The New Romans uh, made Purdy news for a while not just poetry news. He got major reviews in all the big newspapers and he did multiple media uh, presentations to talk about it, interviews for print, radio, and even the evening news. Which must have made Jack McClellan feel a little bit better because at least it meant that Wild Grape Wine, he didn't publish this, but Wild Grape Wine was in the stores at the same time, so maybe they'd buy that instead, or also. Uh, this is the most widely traveled book by a widely traveled poet. Uh, there's a half dozen poems from his 1964 trip to Cuba, a few from Mexico City, a couple in England, uh, leftover from Baffin Island, a few from his Newfoundland trip, and a half dozen that came out of a small Canada Council grant that he got to go to Ottawa, <coughs> excuse me, to observe Parliament in action and write poems about them. Maybe half of the poems are set uh, in and about uh, Roblin Lake including the only poem I know that is set in the Loblaws. Uh, it's called Shopping at Loblaws. It's, it's really more about stalking a woman shopping at Loblaws, but, but, but anyway. Um, it, it's a bit scattered, this book. It's not as good a, a, a book as its immediate predecessors. The Ottawa poems, at least for me, are, are mostly boring because he's bored, because it's boring. Uh, Tomorrow, as he says, the MPs will just bang their desks about something else. For all the traveling, it's Roblin Lake that he remembers the most in this and in other books, uh, which is why we remember it most, and mostly remember him as a poet of that place, as opposed to all the other places that he wrote about. This was shortlisted for a Governor General's Award, 
This was the first year that the Canada Council announced a shortlist in advance of the awards. Uh, it lost to Leonard Cohen's Selected Poems, uh, which is the award that Leonard Cohen turned down because the poems wouldn't permit it. With help from another Canada Council grant, the Purdy spent the next year and a half or so in Europe. They lived in Athens for a while in a three-room suite uh, for five dollars a day. They stayed with Margaret Lawrence. Margaret Lawrence at this time was living in a, a country home outside of England, outside of London, pardon me, and they stayed with her for a while and became close friends. He published two books while they were away. A selection of his friends Milton, Ac Milton Acorn's poetry and a selection of modern Canadian poetry that he edited called Fifteen Winds. Both of these were for Ryerson Press rather than McClellan Stewart. In January of 1970, they returned to Canada for a visiting professorship that Al had been offered at Simon Fraser University in Burnaby. He didn't care for it, didn't like it at all. He didn't like giving lectures and he thought most of the students didn't know much about Canadian or any other literature. Well, yes, that's why we call them students. Uh, Peter Newman uh, offered him a job at the Toronto Star to write a, a daily book page, but he turned it down, uh, said he had no time for it. He published two books in 1970. The first was a collection of poems that came out of his time in Greece called The Quest for Uzo. Uh, this is the most beautifully made book I've seen from this period or frankly any other period in Canadian literature. It's gorgeous. It's a very large book, 12 inches high by 9 inches wide, and it's bound uh, in burlap with a hand-sewn binding, uh, handmade by a fellow by the name of M. Kerrigan Almy in Trenton. Um, it's illustrated throughout with full-page silkscreen lino cuts by uh, Tony Lassing, an artist I believe in Trenton at the time of Greek icons and that sort of thing, and printed on a very heavy handmade paper stock. Only 69 copies of this were made, which is presumably Al Purdy's idea of a joke. Um, it took uh, M. Kerrigan Almy a full year to make those 69 copies, every single one made entirely by hand, including the paper. As far as I know, he made no other books. This one appears to have exhausted him. Uh, the last time I saw a copy of this for sale, it was just under $3,000. Which, honestly, if this was the United States, that would be $300,000. Um, many of the poems in it, because so few people could buy this, uh, many of the poems in it appeared in his next commercial book from McClellan and Stewart called Love in a Burning Building. It's a selection of his love poems, some of which had previously appeared in other books. This was supposed to have been an anthology of Canadian love poems, not just his, but Canadian love poems, selected and edited by Al and illustrated by Harold Town, but the deal fell apart when Town insisted on 75% of the royalties. Uh, so it became a book by Al Purdy instead. They're not so much love poems as poems about love, uh, the ups and downs, what Purdy calls the whole comic disease. He says in it, love is a broken oath by day, but sealed at night again. And judging by this book, he and Yurith did a fair bit of both. Margaret Atwood wrote a review of it. Um, she thought the cover photo, I don't know if you can see it, but she thought it was wildly misleading. It's a you know, couple of teenagers, naked teenagers embracing each other. She thought a more appropriate cover for the book would have been a photo of a middle-aged man and a scowling woman hitting each other with brooms. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Purdy took uh, many more trips to find many more poems. He was always looking for, you know, some photographers look for a photo op. Purdy looks for a poem op wherever he goes. To Japan by himself, uh, across Canada with Yurith, a reading tour in the Arctic, Mexico again, Florida, uh, the Galapagos, South Africa. The best uh, single volume introduction to his early poetry 
And one of the best books of Canadian poetry ever published, obviously in my opinion, is his 1972 uh, selected poems for McClellan and Stewart. It has the poems you should have, and it, it shows the range of his interests and the depth of his affections. Uh, if I were to pick a book of poems to give to a friend from another country, this, this, this to say this is us, this would be the book. If you want the whole Purdy, you can get Beyond Remembering, um, the collected poems of Al Purdy, which is a 600-page book put together by Sam Selecki and Al Purdy and published by Harbor Publishing in British Columbia in 2000. Purdy left McClellan's Stewart in 1990 after a, a dispute involving his autobiography, Reaching for the Beaufort Sea. It's an enjoyable book, his autobiography, but not a great one. He, as I said, he wrote it without access to his papers, since by then he'd sold most of them, so it's, he, his memory is wandering in places. It's still an enjoyable book. He died on April the 20th, 1997, at the age of 81. His ashes are buried uh, beside the mill pond in Ameliasburg. That's his tombstone uh, with his wife, Eurith, who is still alive in front of it. And this is a photograph from a remarkable documentary that was done a few years ago by Brian Johnson and Marnie Jackson uh, called Al Purdy Was Here, um, 2015. If you haven't seen it, I can't recommend it highly enough. It's, I don't normally think that documentaries about poets that make for the most riveting television, but honestly, this one's pretty, pretty damn good. In February of 2016, John Hofsess, who was the founder of the Right to Die Society of Canada, revealed uh, something we didn't know, and that is that uh, he helped Al Purdy die. Uh, Purdy joined the society in 1997. He was very sick, lung cancer uh, and other ailments. Um, and Hofsas and his partner went to the Purdy home in Vancouver, where Alan and Yurith were both living, and they gave Purdy a glass of Chilean wine laced with an illegal sedative, and he drank it while listening to Paul Robeson's Old Man River. Al passed out. Uh, Yurith left the room, and Hofsas and Martin put what's called an exit bag over his head, filled with helium. Uh, he was dead within minutes, peacefully. Uh, in the morning, Yurith called 9-11 and uh, said she'd found her husband dead and no questions were asked, which is why I think even now most of the obituary dates for Purdy are wrong. That is, they have the day that Yurith called the police rather than the day he actually died the night before. <coughs> Sixteen years after that, um, Hofsess, John Hofsess, the man who helped him die, flew to Switzerland and killed himself an hour before the story I just told you was published in Toronto Life magazine, as had been prearranged. They made a deal with Sarah Fulford, the editor of Toronto Life magazine, that he would pub this story would be published just before he would take his, take his own life. And he also had a terminal disease. This is the statue of Purdy that now sits in Queen's Park, mostly because of the efforts of philanthropist Scott Griffin and the poet Dennis Lee. The statue has its own Twitter account, uh, and this is one of the things it tweets about. The squirrels are on the move again, and someone left a half can of Sprite for me. When Purdy died, uh, Patrick Lane said in the Globe and Mail that Canada had lost its greatest poet. Dennis Lee has said several times that Purdy is the best Canadian poet. Lee says, a bad Purdy poem is in a class by itself, but a good Purdy poem is irreplaceable. Body, bittersweet, alive in the time we inhabit. What made Purdy great was not his technical achievements. He said himself that he had no idea how to write poems, that he had no idea what a poet even was. Most poems, he says in an unpublished letter to George Jonas, bore the shit out of me. What made him great was his voice, was that voice. 
The Newfoundland poet Michael Crummy says in Brian Johnson's documentary about Purdy that reading Purdy's poems was the first time he had ever heard a voice in poetry that reminded him of hearing his father and friends talk around the kitchen table. As Dennis Lee says in, in, in For My Money, the best article ever written about Purdy's work, uh, he's Canada's Walt Whitman, Purdy. Uh, he doesn't write or sound anything like Walt Whitman. In fact, when Dennis published the article in Saturday Night Magazine, Purdy was furious and wrote to him and said, what the hell, Walt Whitman? I don't even like Walt Whitman, he bores me. <laughs> but Lee was right, because like Whitman, Purdy gave his country its own poetry by writing about his own place in his own voice, he gave Canada something that it did not have before. And that is a body of major poetry that happens here, in the language of here. And uh, if it's okay, I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. Thank you.